Hey, good Wednesday evening to you all. We welcome you to another uh, Wednesday night class discussion. We are continuing in our questions and answers, and uh, we are just thankful for all the many blessings that God is bestowing upon the Pinnacle Church of Christ. Uh, exciting times around here, and we are delighted that you all are a part of that excitement. So many of you that have um, been helpful to us, praying for us, wishing us well, some even joining with us, um, making contributions toward the, the work and the effort of the Pinnacle Church. Uh, there is just an excitement in the air as we um, look forward to great things in the future, Chuck. We were doing uh, a walk through recently at the new building, yeah. and uh, I was with our sister, Kathy Moore. Oh, yeah. You know, Kathy is one of our great recruiters. She's <laughs> always bringing people, bringing friends, families, uh, 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 hangers on, passers by, new friends. You know, Kathy's just like a one woman welcome wagon. She is a special person. And I told, she she was just going on and on. She was really excited about how nice the building was, how large it was, how tastefully appointed, all those things. I said, well, Kathy, I said, as, uh, you know, Roxy Roker sang in the opening of the Jeffersons, <laughs> We're moving on up. Moving on up. To yeah. the east side. That deluxe apartment. To a deluxe church building in the sky. Yeah. Because we are on a hill over there. So we are. Technically, that holds true. So anyone who has yet to see the new building, you got to come over and see it. Yeah. We think that you will like it. It's going to be used to the glory of God, to the blessing and benefit of the city. And we're excited about that. And, and we are as biblical in this endeavor as we could possibly be. You know, the Bible says one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One shackle for driving. There you go. We got to right. copyright that. We that should, one. because if we don't, Pat Riley will, do, like he did three Pete, and three, then he'll make right. all the money, money from off of it. it. There yeah. you go. Yeah. But tonight we're here uh, for no other purpose than to jump into uh, a Bible question. We, we started this so long ago with the. Um, um, position that we would endeavor to give you a Bible answer to your Bible question. And so many of you have been good about submitting uh, questions. And tonight's um, discussion is really one that I think needs to, to be discussed um, because of the day and age in which we live. And that's simply this question, why? Why do people need to repent? Or maybe even turn it around. Do people need to repent? And if so, why? Well, the short answer to that one is yes. Now, to the question why, well... There are a lot of layers to that. We live in a time, John, when folks have done everything they can to downplay or even dismiss altogether the concept of sin. Yeah. I mean, if you were to walk up to somebody and tell them a sinner, you might you get a punch in the eye about that. Nobody wants to be confronted with their own foibles, with their own shortcomings, with their own failings. Mm -hmm. And yet, when we come face to face with Scripture, there it is. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what Paul said. And we can go ahead and invent uh, different nomenclature or craft euphemisms or whatever we want. But the bo bottom line is we transgress God's law. We fail to do the things that we should do. And those things, the Bible says, constitute sin. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great segue or jumping off point into this, your, your, your little joke there. You walk up to somebody and say, hey, you're a sinner, and most people nowadays would probably say, huh, what's that? You know, we have gotten that far in our that's, culture that's right. that, you know, the concept of sin, you know, it's I'm okay, you're okay, don't say anything about me, I won't say anything about you. That's it. uh, it's a culture of acceptance. Anything and everything pre pretty much goes now. So the concept of sin is, is somewhat of a, um, a foreign concept in this day and age. But let's, let's just define what we're talking about. And so... Um, you mentioned that we sin by thought, word, and deed. We sin by omission and commission. Mm -hmm. You use um, the word, uh, I think it's the Greek word, is it not? The harmatia. Missing the mark. That, that the idea of, right. of you're aiming at the target and you, you, you shoot for it, but you, you overshoot it or you miss the mark or maybe undershoot it. And therein lies sin. Usually in our minds, we think of somebody, you know, just some dastardly person that's a serial out. killer yes yeah, serial killer yeah. that's that's a sinner. there's thing. a sinner i'm not a sinner not but compared to him usually chuck yeah. the 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 everyday run-of-the-mill sin falls along those lines that you just said it's it's something that i ought to be doing yeah. but 
eh, I just don't do it, or it's something that I ought not to be doing, but what the heck, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And we begin to kind of colorize sin, the, 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 the big black sin, the dark, deep, meaningful sin, and the little, you know, not a big deal sin. Well, here's the point. Yeah. All sin separates from God. It does. And in God's eyes, it's a very serious thing. There's a scripture that <laughs> is probably as good a place to begin as any in Luke chapter 13. Mm -hmm. And uh, it reads this way. There were some present at that very time who told him, the him being Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you too will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's it. Now, that's interesting because the people weren't talking about sin. They weren't talking about repentance. They were kind of talking about sin indirectly right. because they wanted to know, well, all these people that had these horrible fates befall them, what did they do? Because it goes all the way back to the time of Job. Mm -hmm. You know, Job, why did, what did you do to cause God to do all these bad things mm -hmm. to you? Well, mm -hmm. I didn't do anything. Job, you know, come on. Job. now you're come lying on. on top of whatever it is that you did. And yeah. he's like, no, really, I didn't. And what Jesus is doing is dispensing of that kind of faulty theology. Because not every time that someone yeah. suffers did they do something to cause the suffering. Now, frequently they did, but not every time. And there are exceptions to that. But the biggest thing that Jesus is concerned about is don't go spending your life walking around worrying about he did this and she did that and mm -hmm. they did this. I mean, they might have. They probably did. But what about you? Right. What about you? He's saying, look, those people that, that Pilate killed, you think that the reason that they were killed because they were more guilty than... No, that's not why. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about those that died because of the faulty construction when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Did they have that coming to them? No. Mm -hmm. What you need to worry about, if you're not right with God, if you don't repent before God, this ultimately is the fate that awaits everyone. I think there's a great phrase that you used just a moment ago, faulty theology. Um, we we uh, live in a time, and, and it, let me explain that, that there's nothing good, nothing bad with... Um, comparative um, um, theology or philosophy, we like to compare. We like to look at my situation versus yours so that I can say, well, you know, I'm not nearly as bad as you. Sure. It, 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 it's good logic, but it's bad theology. Mm -hmm. um, there's this thing called circle logic. I've explained it to mm -hmm. you before that it just kind of, grass is green, my car is green, therefore my car must be made of grass. The logic... <laughs> Is, is I understand, but it's faulty. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that happens a lot with theology or our faith even. We want to look at things that happen and say, aha, therefore, because they're a bad person, that happened. I'm a good person, so good things happen to me. Hey, doesn't the Bible say in Psalm 1, blessed is the man that doesn't hang around with sinners and walk mm -hmm. and sit and stand with them, and, and he'll be like a tree planted. By, so, you know, I get this in my mind that mm -hmm. if I'm a Christian... Nothing bad will ever happen to you. Mm. No, no. Um, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulations, but be mm -hmm. of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so the idea, of Chuck, that when we do a little bit of self-analysis, yeah. man, I don't need, I, I, I can't get you straight. You can't get me straight, but I've got my hands full trying to make sure that I am walking uh, in the right path. And so that's the challenge. Uh, and it's exceedingly difficult because in this world in which we live, people are saying that it really doesn't matter how you live. The Bible says different. Well, we made a couple of points. We dealt with this uh, in our in-person Wednesday night, and they're probably worth bringing up again. Sure. Because if we're going to answer the question, why is there a need for repentance? <clears throat> well, you need to go and systematically go down the line with this. Mm -hmm. A couple of points that are worth consideration. First... A culture that has written sin out of existence yeah. has no need for repentance. The, the reason that this is even a question, John, is because we don't really take sin very seriously as yeah. a people. 
Some people denied the existence of sin altogether. Those uh, uh, naturalists that believe that uh, that the world hey, it, it, and the universe came just, into existence from nothing. Yeah. Well, then if that's the case, there's not really anything yeah. that's good or bad, but just how we interpret that thing to be. And the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't teach situation ethics. The Bible doesn't teach that the only thing that matters is how something affects us. It doesn't teach that at all. In fact, it teaches that we all have a responsibility. We mm -hmm. have responsibility to our creator, first of all, to our brother, second of all, and to ourselves, third of all. But that's not how the way, that's not the way that many, many people today live. Right. They don't want to hear that I can't do this, I can't do that. I mean, I can do whatever I want to do. Um, you know, what was it that Woody Allen famously said as he started dating the adopted daughter of his then girlfriend? He said, the heart wants what it wants. Well, yeah. And, you know, which I think that was kind of a foolish decision on his part. But what he was saying was, look, if I'm interested in something, if I want to do something, that I have the right to do it. And don't you tell me that I can't do it or that that's wrong. That's where our culture largely is. Absolutely. That's the challenge that we face is, as I said a moment ago, getting this world in which we live to recognize that there is a better way, trying to change the hearts. And, 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 and really, that's, that's, no pun intended, at the heart of mm. repentance. There's a verse um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. You know it so well, verse 10, Paul says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Yeah, we're sorry. Yeah, sorry that I got caught. Yeah, we're sorry. Sorry that, you know, it, it, it put me out there, or that you're looking at me in a different light, or any right. number of things. But the heart of repentance is understanding what you just said, that there is a God that I am answerable to, that God has a way that is right for mankind, and somehow I've transgressed. We don't like to say that. I've missed the mark. Mm. And when I recognize that, common sense says, I'm not going to keep driving off in the ditch. I'm going to correct, right. get my car back on the road on the right path. And so religiously, theologically, that's the heart of repentance. In order for us to get to that point, though, we have to believe that there's such a thing as a standard of morality. And if you make up your standard, and I make up my standard, some, well, then there, you know, you do what you want. Yeah. You know, as, as that point, the, the, the famed Satanist Alistair Crowley said, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Mm -hmm. Well, to a lot of people, that is the whole of the law. So if you're getting a sense that this culture is moving ever further away from the biblical standard of morality. And it is. You're probably on to something because it seems to be doing that. So a culture that has written sin out of existence has no need for repentance. Mm -hmm. Here's a second consideration. A church mm -hmm. that worships at the altar of recruitment mm -hmm. has no place for repentance. Now, think about the church that you came up in as a kid. You know, you, you come from a line of preachers. Your dad was a preacher. You know, you had a great mentor in him mm -hmm. uh, and brother L.G. Gilbert and, and others. You've been around some of the greats sure. uh, of the last century. Okay, did they pull any punches in getting out there and, and, and laying the wood to the audience saying, this is what God says. This is what the Bible teaches. This is what we've got to do. Yeah. And... I have a feeling that there was at least more than one occasion in your upbringing and your youth where you were a little bit nervous or anxious or uncomfortable in church. Would that be a safe assumption? That would be a safe assumption because back then, yes, uh, much to our chagrin, we regularly heard about uh, sin, uh, hell, and hell, yeah. and the need for repentance, and and yeah. it was a um, somewhat regular practice, uh, not so much now where people would, would come in and stand and, and yeah. boldly say, brothers and sisters, I've sinned. I repent of my sin, and I ask for the prayers of the church that I may be stronger. Um, there's, there's two sides of that coin. It can become something that is a little passe, but, right. but at least there was the recognition that yes. when I have gone astray, I need to repent. What churches are largely interested in today, and, and again, I don't mean this to be a blanket statement to indict <laughs> every church, but I do mean to indict the churches that are guilty, yeah. that they soft soap the gospel, yeah. 
They don't preach the entire counsel of God, as Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, mm -hmm. but rather they have a feel-good message, kind of the, and when you combine that message with an up with people type worship experience where everybody feels great. Now, is there uh, anybody out there that hallelujah. remembers up with people? Well, I, the, I know what you're talking you about. You go look it up. If you don't know up with people, you should know up with people because up with people was an, it was an entertainment <laughs> low point in the 1960s yep. and seventies in these United religiously States. Religiously it was. And religiously, we got a lot of churches that are doing this. You, you know, the equivalent of that today. What? Jesus gets us. Yeah, he gets us. Yeah. He, yeah. he, he gets where we are, and he's Same trying concept. to move us to where he wants us to be, well, but, but you're correct. So here's the thing about this. Churches are teaching this feel-good message. Mm -hmm. They're watering down the gospel. That's They're it. not talking about sin. They're not making people uncomfortable because they want to have greater numbers. So if you're worshiping at the altar of recruitment, mm -hmm. I want to bring people in. I want to recruit them. Well, then I'm going to tell them what they want to hear. And here's the incipient danger in that. That is as anti-gospel as anything that you can think of. What does Paul say to his son in the faith, Timothy? Flipping over there right now. He said, you yeah. know, the time's coming when people aren't going to want to hear the whole counsel of God. Giving heed to seducing spirits they're going and to, doctrines they're of They're going to devils. doctrines of demons. That's I mean, it, that's, that's, that's what it says. Yeah. But he says... In order to draw, you know, these disciples after themselves are going to distort the truth. He says that to him in Acts 20. Mm -hmm. Then he tells Timothy, in the latter days, men are not going to endure sound, sound doctrine, doctrine, but will gather around themselves. Teachers a, having a, a great number of ears. teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. In other words, woe to the preacher, woe to the church that gets up and tells me something I don't want to hear. Now, frequently... That will be couched in different language. Like, right. well, I had to leave that church. Why'd you leave? Were, were they unbiblical? Were they not teaching? I wasn't being fed. I wasn't being fed nine times out of mm. ten equates to they weren't saying what I wanted to hear. Well, here's a newsflash, Walter Cronkite. Our job as ministers of the gospel is not to tell you what you want to hear. Now, hopefully we're saying things that, that you need to hear, that, that you want to hear, that, that you long to be closer to God. But our job is not to make everybody feel better. If you're not doing what's right, you don't need to feel better. You need to repent and you need to return to God. That's what the word means. Metanoia means to change your mind. Mm -hmm. And the idea that our minds don't need changing, that we're fine exactly as we are, that I don't need to listen to God, that I am a law unto myself, that is is toxic it yeah. just is a couple three things yeah that whole argument about them not being fed well that's because uh you had a special diet yeah and and you know we're, we're trying to feed you some nutritionally sound we're trying to throw a vegetable in every there now you and go. again there not you just go. hot fudge sundays yeah but, you know so that that that's sometimes what that um, code means that I only want to hear what I want to hear. But you're right, Chuck. I think the challenge for this age and every age, as far as the church is concerned, is to speak the truth in love. Ephesians mm -hmm. 4.15, we've got to tell the truth, not in a hurtful or no, harmful no, way, no. but someone said that the responsibility of the church is to um, uh, um, comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. That's it. Therein lies the rub. It really point. is that, that somehow the gospel has got to have enough um, uh, energy, and it does, to, to comfort those that are hurting and afflicted, but those that are just sitting yes. back complacent and status quo needs to be shaken up. Think about the example of our Lord mm -hmm. in that realm. Mm -hmm. The people who were broken, who were beaten down, who were on the fringe, that no one cared for, that no one loved, that didn't have anyone to be an advocate for them. He was there. He was there for them. Yeah. The ones that thought they had everything figured out and they had, uh, God was lucky to have someone like them as a partner. Jesus was very good at, at putting the needle pretty, to those pretty people. Pretty rough things to yes, say. I'll, yes, I'll he go did. to one better. John, uh, the revelator, uh, records the words of the ascended Christ as he talks about the state of the church and he goes through the, the seven churches. When he gets to one mm -hmm. that is, as you said, comfortable and, and, and status quo and fat and happy, he says, man, I would that you were hot or cold. If you're too hot, we can cook it. Or cold. If you're too cold, we can heat you up. But because you say, you know, I'm lukewarm, mm -hmm. 
I will spew you out of my mouth. That's a condemnation against the religiously comfortable, this generation, I believe, oh, that my feel like I'm okay, you're okay, it's an age of acceptance, anything goes. No, that flies in the face of what the Bible actually teaches. If our world in 2023, <clears throat> 2024 America ought to be comfortable or used uh -huh. to anything, it ought to be lukewarm Christianity because yeah. we got tons of it. Yeah. It and really it's, is. I mean, we got more people, let's just be honest, we got more people in our pews that are 10 times more excited about the 2024 presidential election mm -hmm. than they, they are, are their own walk with God. Going to you, heaven. You know that's the truth. Mm -hmm. They get excited about their candidate or about their party or about, uh, are, are the Democrats going to run Congress? I mean, they're really excited about that. Or are the Republicans going to take their, I mean... I'm to hear with this stuff. I, I wish our people were excited about the Lord as yeah. they are about politics. Absolutely. Let's listen to this from 1979 from the pen of Rule Lemons. And tell me this doesn't describe today's church. How long will it take us to realize that sins are to be repented of? Mm -hmm. Must we forever be content with <laughs> trying to accommodate the gospel to the sins of the world? The average heathen doesn't even feel he has any sins big enough to repent of. That's right. And we're coddling Nineveh into believing that repentance is not such a great thing? After all, look at us. The way we preach it in most places, we don't really give the world much to repent of. And the storm keeps on raging. It will get worse. If we haven't the strength to stand against a society that we claim to be sinful, we can't blame them for scoffing at the idea that we're living by the power of a resurrected Christ. Mm. If those words were true yeah. in 1979, how much more today? They ring uh, uh, poignantly true, and I think what Lemons is, is saying uh, there that resounds is the fact that uh, we have to cultivate that, that sense of repentance. There, there's a uh, passage there, you know it so well, Acts chapter 2, uh, Day of Pentecost. It, it says something to the fact they were cut to the heart. To the heart. That, that, that's it. Mm -hmm. The idea of repentance is not just, oh, well... Yeah, I assent that you're right, and, and I may be wrong I should probably this. do 5% better. Probably, yes. Yeah, well, maybe I ought to do that better. No, I sense that you are cut to the, When you hear the gospel That's right. and you look at yourself uh, comparatively mm -hmm. as opposed to what the, the, the Word of God teaches that we ought to be, there ought to be a sense of urgency. Yeah. The, the, there ought to be a sense of, man, that's I need right. to do something right now. And so that's, that's right. what repentance is. When you're cut to the heart, you realize the error of your ways. And then what does an honest person do about that? Oh, well, you know, stuff happens. Or yes. do you say, I'm going to make a change. That's right. And so first of all, our culture <clears throat> is not going to push you toward repentance because most people in culture don't even think there's anything right. that needs repentance repentance secondly too many churches have watered this down to the point that if you ask people if they go to church they imagine you walk into a darkened building with a laser light show with a really good kicking concert to, to most smoke, folks that's church smoke machines in the new building yeah like the miami hurricanes we run through the smoke through and then the run smoke. into the music i mean uh, the fact that church basically means music anymore today no. tells you everything that you need to know. That's not what church is. That's not what worship is. That's a component, but it's not the totality. Here's the third part. Individuals that don't recognize their own sin, they have no use for repentance. Yep. And consider some of the things that we do to shift the blame. One, we scapegoat. Okay, well, yeah, I know I did this, but the but reason I did this was because reason. of him or because of you. And uh, those people made me do it. Well, you know, when you place your wrongs on another person so they can carry them, that doesn't ever end well. And, you know, you see that example in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 16. The high priest would come and place his hands on the goat that had been chosen. He yeah. would recite the sins of the nation, and they would send the goat out into the wilderness, away from the people. Mm -hmm. Okay, we try to do that all the time, but we do that, well, I, it's my parents' fault, or it's my wife's fault, or it's my kid's fault, or uh, that mean boss at work, it's his fault. Well, you know, not that I ever quote this man, and, uh, you know, uh, may he rest in peace, right. such as uh -huh. it is, 
uh, but the late musician, businessman Jimmy Buffett in his oh, uh, Margarita uh, Man uh, epic song Margaritaville, you know, he says, "Well, you know, it's not my fault. Well, it could be my fault, and at the end, it, it's my own it's fault." Amount. Okay, <laughs> so you know, he had enough sense to recognize that. Sometimes we don't. So scapegoating is never going to end well. Here's another thing that we tend to do that that takes the onus of repentance off of us. We rationalize. And that's the thing that Jesus is trying to get at in having us not make intricate, ingenious excuses for our own behavior. And when people quote anything from the Sermon on the Mount, most of what they quote is judge not, right. lest you be judged. Jesus is not saying you can't make judgments. You make judgments every day. He's no. saying don't make erroneous judgments. Yeah. Don't make false judgments. Don't make hypocritical judgments. Judge righteously. I'm not going to judge that. you by one standard and judge myself by another. That's it. If I'm going to judge John by a standard, then I need to judge myself by the same standard. That's what he's saying. But when we rationalize, well, you know, John should have known better. I can't believe John did that. John should be ashamed of himself, and John should repent. Well, but Chuck, you did the same thing. Well, yeah, but oh, I, well. had, I had... I had different circumstances right. yeah. i had a lot of pressure at home and i wasn't feeling well we were having some family issues and we were having financial problems and we had locusts and rain oh and my. hail okay. and an earthquake and a, right. and a hurricane and you know you can just that, stack that and stack and stack well yeah exactly i mean you remember the scene mm -hmm. in the blues brothers where John Belushi had just kept blowing off his ex-girlfriend, Carrie Fisher, mm -hmm. and she finally is trying to kill him, and she's got him there, and she's got the gun. She's about ready to shoot him. Mm -hmm. And he says, why weren't you there? To well, it wasn't my fault. That's right. It was rain. It was a flood and hail. And he makes up all this, and she knows he's lying. But you know, we honestly think right. that that's going to work with God. Well, that, that we're going to make excuse. these excuses. You know, they were on a mission from God. They so were that, on a mission from that. God, yeah, kind of. That is um, the, the heart of the matter, and I think we could go on and on um, looking at this, but there is a point where people need to recognize, and, and as you were saying, it is an individual thing that you begin to look inward. We're so good at pointing the finger mm. outward. Someone yeah. said when you point the finger outward, you fail to realize that there are three fingers pointing back at you. And so repentance is one of those things that each of us need to kind of look in the mirror. Uh, and, and by the way, I think we need to say this, Chuck, it's not just a one-time thing. Mm -mm. I understand that, you know, we've, we've, we've really grounded into the minds of people that the steps for salvation here, repent, confess, you know, be, be baptized. But that repentance is something that you continually take inventory. Mm. You begin to do a checkup, as they say, from the neck up to make sure that you're on the right path. Uh, my dad used to say, it's like driving a car. You make these these tiny little adjustments all along the way. It doesn't seem like a big thing, but that's what keeps you um, on the straight and narrow. And it's the same way for us. Repentance is the first step toward restoration. Mm -hmm. I remember the story of the prodigal son. Jesus tells this story masterfully with this young man who goes and wastes everything that he has mm -hmm. in riotous living. But there's one little verse that sometimes we overlook. When he was in the, the lowest point, the pig pen, mm. uh, the Bible says he came to himself and then he made the change. There are a lot of people that are perhaps some watching us tonight that are going through things in life. Life happens. I don't know where you are on the spectrum of life, but you get to that point. We all do. Mm. And the critical question is, what will you do? God offers us the, the opportunity to repent. And if we are truly repentant, God is willing to forgive and to cleanse and to restore. Repentance is the first step toward that restoration. But if you don't repent, it's a sad fate that awaits. The church <laughs> has a lot of improving to do according to James 5 and verse 16, oh, wow. which tells us confess your sins one to another. If you come into some of our meetings, you wouldn't figure anybody has any sins to repent of. You know, well, I, you know, I, yeah, some people sin, but, you know, I don't sin. Well, we all sin. Okay, be honest about this. Del Fezenfeld said this. We're too proud to admit our real spiritual needs. That's we don't good. want anyone to think that our marriage is struggling, that our children are rebellious, that our walk with God is shallow and frustrating, that we can't control our angry, impatient, critical responses. That hits most of us mm -hmm. on some level or other. You know, the very first time the gospel 
was preached. Mm -hmm. Very first time when John just referenced, they were cut to the heart cut and said to, to heart. Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? You know what the answer was? Repent. Repent. That's it. And be baptized, every one of you, That's in the it. name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Why must we repent? Because that is the first step. After we believe in Jesus, after we've acknowledged our own sin, we've got to repent of that sin and turn to Christ so that times of refreshing will come. Anything that the New Testament tells us saves us. It's something that we can't be saved without. And when Jesus says, unless you repent, you too will likewise perish. Well, we need to take that seriously. We need to recognize that sin is an ever-present danger. John brought up something just a minute ago, and we, this might be a good place for us to close. Uh, I was baptized one time. You know, one Lord, one faith, <laughs> one baptism, one shackle for drive. That was coming. Just once. I have to repent every oh, single day of my life. That's right. Because what that means is I'm trying to configure my thinking with God's thinking. I'm trying to see things the way God sees them. Not the way I would like them to be, but the way God tells me that they are to be. And that involves repentance. It, it involves changing our minds. Mm -hmm. And that's not something, well, yeah, I bit, did that back when I was uh, 17 years old. No. I changed my mind. <laughs> no, you got to change your mind every day. Because the works of the flesh are pretty obvious. We know what we want to do. We know what we like to do. But do we know what God wants us to do? That's what's involved here. And that's why repentance is a necessity. Absolutely. Let's go to God in prayer as we close out tonight. Father God, we're so thankful for your word, for the truth of the gospel that helps us to see when we have missed the mark, when we have sinned. And when we sin, Heavenly Father, your word prescribes the answer for that condition. That is that we repent, we change our mind, and we change our direction, and we draw close to you so that you can draw close to us. Father, we just pray that if there's one under the sound of my voice, even this very night, that has looked into the mirror and has seen uh, the need to change uh, their lives, Father, we pray that they would take advantage of your grace and mercy, that they would repent, uh, that they would do those things that your word teaches that one must do, to have a right relationship with you. Father, we're thankful for all the blessings that you're bestowing on us here at Pinnacle. We're excited about what the future holds. We pray your continued blessings upon us as we strive to live for you and change uh, the lives of men and women for the better here in our area. And Father, we know that in our body, there's uh, many who are going through times of sickness. We just pray for them, Heavenly Father, that you would restore them to a reasonable portion of their health and strength. And especially for those that are grieving the loss of a loved one, we just ask that you would give them the, the peace and the comfort uh, that only you can give. Be with us all as we strive to live for you. Uh, we thank you so much for Jesus, and it is in his name that we pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. Hi, I'm Chuck Monan, one of the ministers here at the Pinnacle Church of Christ. If you are despairing of how crazy the world has gone, how it seems to be spinning off its axis, how there's so much confusion and conflict and discord, you need to come join us in the Lord's service here at Pinnacle. There's all kinds of folks around here that you would get to know who would become dear, dear, trusted friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a special vibe that's going on here as we see people from disparate backgrounds from all over our city and in fact, in different places in the country, who are getting together for no other purpose than to love the Lord, to serve Him, and to encourage each other. So if you're looking for a church home, come on out to Pinnacle with us. You'll be glad that you did.